I would like to extend a large thank you to this week's Creepscast sponsor, Audible. James Patterson's Thrilling Adventure series gets an exclusive audio-only origin story in Daniel X, Genesis, brought to life by an all-star cast. Daniel is an ordinary teenager just trying to fit in at school when he suddenly finds out, on his 16th birthday no less, that he's anything but ordinary. Not only is he an alien, but he has superpowers that let him conjure anything that he wants. And it turns out that his parents didn't die in a car accident, but they were killed in an epic battle with an intergalactic villain. So those superpowers are just what Daniel needs to join the fight, if he can muster the courage to save the human race. It's a fast-paced, funny, fully immersive adventure featuring performances by Michael Asimino. Abigail Breslin, Mercedes Rule, Jimmy Simpson, and many more. You can find it only on Audible. Listen at audible.com slash genesis. Again, that's audible.com slash genesis. Thank you to Audible for sponsoring this week's episode. The Department for Strange Affairs was located under central London. A line in the underground ran right next to it, and every few minutes the entire office shook as another train rattled by. This cavernous space had been created in World War II to offer protection to government officials from falling bombs while they worked. Its existence has been kept a secret at the time for security reasons. Eighty years later, it was still veiled in secrecy, and it housed people who worked for the government people like me. And I worked the night shift. Arriving at the department, I reported in to my supervisor as usual. He was a former soldier with a wooden prosthetic leg that he refused to have updated. He was always immaculately dressed in a striped three-piece suit. I wore plainer clothes, ones in which I would blend in. It was hot that July. A heat wave was beginning and it was forecast to last for weeks. I wore light brown cotton trousers and a polo shirt with a designer label, sneakers and no socks. I had started to go bald prematurely, so I had made the decision recently to shave my head. As the heat dug in its heels, this felt like a good decision. My supervisor had nothing pressing to tell me so I logged onto my laptop. The hum of fans trying to keep the vast array of equipment packed into the office cool filled the air. Seated at a line of desks in front of me, the monitoring team were a picture of concentration despite the uncomfortable conditions. They had access to CCTV cameras throughout the city, and it could listen to transmissions by the emergency services. They could also tap into private conversations if required and had access to a database holding millions of personal and business details. As for data protection laws, well, they were swept under the carpet on a regular basis. I just started to check my emails when an alert had popped up on my screen. The monitoring team had picked up a call from a member of the public reporting and grave robbers. I clicked on the sound file. The recording was good quality. I could hear the mail caller's agitated breathing as he spoke into his phone. There's a ragged hole in the ground. I can see right into the coffin. The lid's been smashed through and it's empty. The body's gone. It's the most horrible thing. The people who did this should be locked up and the key thrown away. I didn't need to listen to any more of the recording and I glanced over at my supervisor. I could tell from his expression that we were both thinking the same thing. Grave robbers. If only it was that simple. I'll take the van, I told him and headed for the lift that would take me back to the surface. Driving anywhere in London was a stop-start frustration fast. How movie makers expected anybody to believe that there could be a high-speed car chase throughout the streets of the capital, it always amazed me. I had driven one of the department's top-of-the-range hybrid vans out of a parking lot and set a route on the satellite navigation based on information provided by the monitoring team which would take me to the graveyard. Purely based on distance, this showed a journey which should have taken 20 minutes, but I was already stuck in traffic. 
and someone in front of me was trying to do a three-point turn to break free of the gridlock I had. They were making things worse by blocking traffic, trying to move in the opposite direction. I sighed and took the opportunity to catch up on the flow of information coming my way from the monitoring team via a console on the dashboard. The opened grave had been occupied by Mr. Joseph Wilson. He had been 58 years old when he had died of a heart attack. He left a widow and two children and a will that was being disputed. He had been buried one week before. The traffic ahead of me moved and I made it a whole six feet forwards before the cars in front of me grounded to a halt again. And then I received a new message. Subject seen boarding a bus. Reacting to this, I reset the satellite navigation, replacing the address of the graveyard with a home address also pulled from the database. My new ETA was 35 minutes, if I had been the proverbial flying crow. As it was, it took me over an hour to reach my destination. I turned into a residential street. The houses looked to be nothing special, but the location would have made them very expensive. It was quiet apart from a dog barking from behind one of these sets of drawn curtains. The residents would have their feet up, binge watching some series about dragons or superheroes. I managed to find a space to park up in and then sat and waited. While I did, I watched a recording of the onboard footage from the CCTV cameras on the night bus. The quality of the footage wasn't great, but I could make out the subjects a blank expression. It had been crowded on the bus and other passengers an inch away from the subject. This being London, none of them had said or done anything else. They had blanked out the strangeness in their midst. The footage finished and I returned my full attention to the street in front of me. There was a stop two streets away and the bus was due. A few minutes later, my patience was rewarded. The subject appeared at the end of the street. He was moving in the shuffling, shambolic way that they all do. The dead when they rise from the grave. After climbing out of the ground, it was very common for zombies to try and go home. Whether it was a conscious decision to return to where they lived, or some kind of primitive instinct no one knew. Whatever was driving him, Mr. Joseph Wilson, deceased, was staggering towards what used to be his front door. And I was there to intervene. I climbed out of the van and walked slowly towards him. In most of these situations that I encountered in my work, it was important to keep things calm as long as possible. Not just for health and safety reasons, but also to avoid alerting members of the public that there was anything wrong. I stepped into his path and said, You are dead, Mr. Wilson. You need to go back to your grave. His eyes were glazed over and the first signs of decay were showing on his mottled skin. At my words, his mouth opened and a quiet groan emerged. I'm not going to have any arguments about this, Mr. Wilson, I continued. His groan had grown volume and he reached out towards me with his hands in a threatening way. I could see the marks in his hands and the soil under his nails from when he had broken through the coffin lid and dug his way out. I decided there was no point continuing trying to reason with me and moved back over to the van where I unlocked and swung open the back doors. Before setting off, I had put a cool box in the back of the van. I now popped the lid of the cool box. The brain inside it had been supplied by a local hospital with, with the department at a private agreement. It was still fresh and very appealing to Mr. Wilson. Its odor had drifted out to him and he sniffed at the air before turning to face the van. Brain must eat brain. He growled and staggered towards the open doors. I had placed the cool box just out of reach and Mr. Wilson had to climb into the van to reach the irresistibly tasty to him contents. As soon as he was all the way in, I slammed the door shut and I locked them. I noticed a couple of the curtains twitching as I made my way around to the driver's door, but I wasn't concerned. A van driver slamming his door shut was not going to lead to anything more than annoyed mutterings from the residents. They would think that I was delivering groceries. 
Back behind the wheel, I glanced over my shoulder. There was a steel mesh between me and the back of the van, where Mr. Wilson was knelt over noisily devouring the brain. Once he was finished, he could get as angry as he wanted. The mesh would keep me safe. I reported the state of play to the department and received a confirmation that I was to proceed with my package back to the graveyard. The roads were quieter at this later hour and I arrived without too many more frustrating delays. I drove along the narrow winding road in the cemetery, which led past rows of old graves that were darkened and stooping with age, before reaching an open area where the new burials took place. A tent had been erected over one plot. As I turned the engine off, two of my colleagues from the department emerged. Already? I asked. Yeah, we're good to go, one of them replied. And together we went to fetch Mr. Wilson from the van. With the brain eaten, he was in a complete rage and was thrashing around, slamming himself into the side of the van and the moment that we had opened the doors and he saw us, he launched himself at us. Handling a zombie is not a skill that is taught in school, but one that we had all picked up on the job, and steering Mole clear of his teeth, we restrained him and carried him into the tent. A halogen light illuminated the steel cage that had been constructed by my colleagues over the broken coffin. A hatch in the front of the cage hung open and we tipped Mr. Wilson in. He fell back into the coffin and before he could twist around, the hatch was closed and secured by a padlock and then my colleagues began to fill the grave back in with dirt. I left them to it and walked away to the sound of muffled groans. Mr. Wilson would not be leaving his grave again, and would soon fall silent as decaying insects had their way. This case could be marked complete. The rest of the night passed without any further incidents being reported and just after 8am, I turned off my laptop and I left the office. I had recently moved into an apartment complex in a converted dockside warehouse. It was stylish and close enough to work for me to walk home. An early mist was being burnt off by the sun of what was forecasted to be another very hot day as I strolled along the banks of the river. I had a smile on my face. I enjoyed my work and I enjoyed my life. My apartment was on the 10th floor. A spacious, a corner property with a mezzanine level which I used as my bedroom area. The owners of the apartment directly above me were remodeling their property, and I often arrived home to the sound of hammering and drilling coming from above my ceiling. The noise was not a problem thanks to my unique sleeping arrangements. I had got the idea from an individual that I had encountered on a previous case at the Department for Strange Affairs. The coffin was custom made, constructed from oak, it had a silk interior lining, a luxurious mattress and cotton pillows. Once closed, it was completely soundproof. There was also a surround sound speaker system installed, should I wish to listen to calming ambient music. The temperature and the airflow inside the coffin changed in response to the external conditions. It was the perfect relaxing environment as far as I was concerned. I lowered myself in and I was asleep in seconds. The following night, the office was its usual hive of activity. I reported to my supervisor and asked if there was any ongoing cases. It's quiet out there at the moment, he replied. While it is, there is something I would like you to look into. There is a large antiquarian bookshop from which the department using a cover identity, has bought a number of volumes on fantastical creatures. The books have been digitized and have made valuable additions to the database. I have heard through private channels that when the owner opens up the shop in the morning, he is finding the remains of books that had been on the shelves. The books have been burned. It could be a malicious person that is doing this, in which case we can't help. But there are no signs of anyone breaking in. So I would like you to go there tonight while the shop is closed and check things out. I headed back up to the surface. The tube was the quickest way to get to the bookshop, and there was a station across the road from the anonymous looking office block, which hid the entrance to the department and housed its fleet of vehicles. Three changes of underground lines later, 
I emerged onto a street from which the last of the late night shoppers were drifting away. There were people milling around in the street in front of a pub, holding glasses and chatting and trying to stay cool in the still oppressive heat. None of them gave me a second look as I walked up to the bookshop. It was dark inside and a closed sign hung on the door. Using skeleton keys, I let myself in. Rows of books rose all around me. There were more stacked on the floor, apart from a small till and a ladder for reaching the upper levels. As far as I could see, every inch of the shop was taken up with books. As I moved along the rows and checked out the spines, I saw that they all appeared to be factual. There was no place for flights of fictional fantasy in this collection. There were volumes on ancient history, geography, volcanology, economics, and a myriad of other topics. Most were hardbacks and looked as though they had been well read. Moving deeper into the shop, the shelves stretched on into the distance, and there were little alcoves and dark corners where more books were crammed into. The titles became more eclectic. There were works on numerology and dowsing and one especially fat volume entitled Mythical Beasts of the English Channel. That one caught my eye. As yet, I had seen no signs of burnt books and was wondering if my time would be better spent elsewhere when a book on a shelf in front of me had moved. Its top corner slid out a little and then the rest of the book until it was hanging apparently in thin air. My experience of the strange had kicked in. Moving nice and slow, I reached into a pocket, took out a pair of department-issued glasses, and I put them on. I had 20-20 vision so I could see the natural world perfectly well. The glasses meant that I could see beyond the ordinary. Standing in front of me, holding the book that had just been removed from the shelf, was a ghost. It was a hazy form, mist-like, and as it moved, trails of gray-white spectral matter were left momentarily in its wake. I stood very still, wanting only to observe at this point, and as I had been anticipating, the ethereal hand which was holding the book began to glow red. A dull pink wash at first, that grew brighter and sharper until the hand was an angry red, and then the book it held burst into flames. The fire crackled and spat in, and less than a minute the book was consumed, and the ghost let go of it. The bemused owner would find its ashes on the floor in the morning. The ghost had been too focused on its act of destruction to notice me, and it was now moving along the shelves, perhaps looking for its next papery victim. I backtracked to the front of the shop, took on my mobile, and I called it in. Five minutes later, I received a message telling me that support was on the way. I wiped the sweat from my face, and I waited. The cavalry arrived in the shape of one of my colleagues who had been at the graveyard the night before. He was carrying what looked like a laptop bag as I let him in. What technological ghost catching marvel have you brought with you? I whispered. He patted the bag and said with a grin, You'll see. Now, do you want to show me where the unwelcome ghost is? Together, we headed back into the depths of the shop. Just ahead of us, there was a new flare-up as flames destroyed another book. I put my glasses back on. The red was fading from the ghost's hand, back into the gray-white of the rest of its form. And dispelling ghosts was not a precise science. I had seen it done in various ways, with varying degrees of success. And as my colleague unzipped the bag, I was intrigued. How was he going to deal with this apparition? He did not take a piece of fancy looking tech out of the bag, as I had been expecting. Instead, he produced a book, an ancient one from its appearance. It had a thick leather cover with an ornate silver clasp on the front holding it shut. We acquired this from another bookshop, one on the outskirts of London, my colleague said. It was not so that we could digitize the contents to add to our store of knowledge, but for situations such as this. And then he undid the clasp and opened the book. The pages inside were blank. They began to flutter and my colleague grinned again. I turned back to face the ghost. Small patches of darkness like rain brooding inside a cloud had appeared in it. And they were growing. The darkness is fear, my colleague said. And I saw that he had donned a pair of glasses of his own and was studying the ghost. 
Meanwhile, the pages in the book were turning over faster and faster, being moved by some force that I could not see. And then, to my amazement, the ghost started to move towards the open bug. I realized that it was being drawn in, and there was not a thing it could do about this. I glimpsed a mouth opening in the specter's twisted face, saw a scream forming, and then it was gone, into the pages and my colleague was closing the cover, snapping the clasp back into place. He took off his glasses and said, Excellent. We high-fived and he put the book back in its bag. What will you do with it? I asked. File it, he replied. We left the bookshop together. A few late-night drinkers were still gathered outside the pub. A tired-looking barman was asking them to drink up and leave. None of them had a clue what had just happened across the road from them. The bookshop owner would also never know what we had done. The burned books that he would find in the morning would be the last, and he could carry on his business as before. Why do you think it did it? I asked my colleague. The ghost, what did it have against the bugs? He shrugged and said, It's rare to be able to get into the mind of a ghost. Maybe it was a kind of censorship, and it was only targeting certain types of bugs. Maybe it had been murdered by a librarian. We'll never know. It was one more mystery to add to the list, and one more case that had been successfully closed. There were still trains running on the underground and I was planning on returning with my colleague to the department when my phone began to ring. It was the monitoring team. There's something in the river. The calm, professional voice telling me this did not add. Something that really should not be there, but I knew this would be the case. I ended the call and did not have long to wait before a van pulled up. I was handed the keys and told the van was loaded with diving equipment and weaponry. I set off into the night. The person who had driven the van out to me had a preset the satellite navigation to take me to a bend in the river that cut through a district popular with financial traders. I climbed out of the van and stretched my arms. Office blocks stood all around me each as featureless as the next. The lights were still on inside them, even though from where I stood, they looked empty for the night. There were no residential apartments and a lone coffee shop was closed. It would be tomorrow morning before I could buy a pretentious overpriced latte, all of which suited me. The less people who saw me working, the better. I was standing in one of the deserted squares around which the office blocks were placed. There were concrete slabs to sit on, concrete garden features filled with brown water deprived grass, and concrete artworks. I walked over to the concrete barrier which overlooked the river. On my drive there, I had listened to a recording of the call which had brought me here. It had been made by the piloted police helicopter who had passed over this area on their way elsewhere. We have sighting of an object in the river. It's too big to be a person and it's not a boat, the pilot had said. It's some kind of creature. There was a degree of hesitancy in their voice. From my experience in this field, I know a part of them would have wanted to say nothing, rather than admit to have spotted as something strange. Thankfully, they had called it in, and then probably sped up so they could get away. The monitoring team who had picked up the call then forwarded it on to me, had also listened to a police dispatcher informing the pilot that no units were available to go investigate. And that was A-OK, -okay, because the Department for Strange Affairs was on it. The barrier only came up to my chest and I draped my arms over it as I stared into the water. There is very little natural tide here and the river was dark and still. There were no signs of any strange creature. Yet... To follow the course of the river by road or foot was inefficient. Instead, I returned to the van, got changed into a wetsuit, and chose a slimline high-tech harpoon from the weapon rack. Then, with the harpoon secure in the waterproof backpack, I vaulted the barrier and landed with a quiet splash in the river. I had no firm evidence where any creature might be headed, and no more reports had been picked up by the monitoring team. 
so I mentally tossed a coin in, made my choice, and I set off swimming downriver. This soon took me past the financial district into an area that had not yet been reached by the developers. It wouldn't be long before the scaffolding and the cranes went up, and artists' impressions of luxury apartments and desirable office space began to be advertised. For now, I was alone, with the derelict buildings on either side of me. The heat did not bled into the river, and I was grateful for the protection of my wetsuit from the cold, clammy water. I swam on. Turning the next bend, I saw an abandoned barge tethered to a wooden jetty and noticed that there was a lot of silt in the water. The silt meant that there had been a disturbance here, recently, by something substantial. Moving nice and slow, I took the harpoon out of a backpack. Every nerve in my body was tingling. The creature that I was looking for was close, and I was sure of it. I peered down into the water, tried to see through the murk, and there it was, under the barge. I could make out a vast eye in the midst of a dark shape. I aimed the harpoon. As I did, a tentacle flashed out. I tried to move away, but I was too slow. The tentacle wrapped around my ankle. I kicked out at it, but all that happened was that the tentacle had tightened, and now more tentacles were unfurling and heading my way. All the while, the eye watched. There was an intelligence there. It had hidden beneath the barge, biding its time, and I had fallen into its trap. I swore into frustration. A second tentacle had by now encircled my waist. A third had found my other leg. And together the tentacles were starting to drag me down into the water, closer to the creature's body. I knew that struggling was pointless. There was only one way that I could survive this. I let myself go limp, as the tentacles continued to envelop me in their slimy grip. I took a deep breath, possibly the last that I would ever take, and I was pulled under the surface. Below the eye, a mouth opened, a void ringed by teeth that looked razor sharp. In seconds, I would be forced inside it. The teeth would clamp down and the river would run red with blood. I counted one second, two. I needed to leave it as late as I could. I could not afford to miss. The eye was six feet away from me, observing me, savoring the sight of its feast. I pulled the release. The harpoon shot forward and pierced the center of the eye. The creature's mouth opened wider. A bubbling scream appeared and its body tensed. Its tentacles flailed and released me. I propelled myself further away from it with as much force as I could and frantically swam for the jetty and pulled myself up onto it. In the water, the creature thrashed about frantically, sending water flying out. I scrambled away and I called it in. The monitoring team asked me what designation the creature was. A species unknown, I gasped, and then rolled over on my back and lay looking up at the stars until... My colleagues arrived to remove the creature from the river. It would be studied and then filed in one of the department's secure warehouses that were scattered around the city. After handing over the case and returning to the office to write up my report, my supervisor gave me permission to finish early. Dawn was breaking as I limped home. I slept for 12 hours straight. Thankfully, I then had a scheduled night off to look forward to. I was still aching for my encounter with the river creature, so it was the much-needed R&R. I was a loner and dedicated to my work, but enjoyed exploring my home city whenever I could. London's vast, fragmented space still had surprises for me. I left my apartment as a stunning red sky marked the ending of another sweltering day. I walked for hours along streets steeped in history. The city had survived to fire and plague and corrupt rulers. It had welcomed immigrants from across the world. If you had money, there was entertainment to be had at any time of night or day. If you were poor, the city was indifferent to your pain. And that way London was no different to any other metropolis. I paused on the steps of a cathedral. I wasn't religious in any way, but I loved the architecture of these soaring buildings. High above me, gargoyles peered out into the sky. 
I followed their gaze and despite the heat of the night, a cold chill ran through my body. The moon dominated the night sky. It was not a full moon. Tomorrow night it would be, which meant the Department for Strange Affairs would be on high alert. I turned round and headed home. After another good day's sleep, I arrived at my desk early. The monitoring team were huddled over their consoles and my supervisor was on the phone. He waved me over and paused his conversation to say, A call has been picked up from a five-star hotel. It sounds like they could need our brand of expertise. Be a good chap and check it out. I got the location of the hotel from the monitoring team, loaded up a backpack with equipment that I might need and set off on foot. As I weaved my way through the crowds, I listened to the recording of the call which had made this my business. The caller sounded extremely posh and extremely rattled. They're in the Opal Suite, our most exclusive room. Their miniature monster is hideous. I feel sick just talking about them. If this gets out, we're ruined. Ruined. I ended the recording and checked the background details that I had also been sent. The call had been made by the manager of one of London's leading hotels to its billionaire owner. The cheapest room was £1,000 a night. The Opal Suite would set you back a cool 24k. It took out most of the top floor of the hotel and was actually a dozen rooms, with a reception, a master bedroom, steam room and communications hub amongst the facilities. It sounded like a different world and as I stepped through the entrance doors of the hotel, I was wowed by the marble and the mahogany which filled the reception area. Everything had been polished within an inch of its life. If I had had sunglasses with me, I would have put them on to stop myself from being dazzled. Hoping there was not a service charge for walking on the floor, I went over to the reception desk and asked for the manager. He was expecting me and thought that I had been sent by the owner of the hotel. I didn't tell him who I really was or how I knew about his crisis, but I assured him that yes, I knew what I was doing and that I would be discreet. He gave me a passkey and told me to hurry up. I took a lift that played classical music and it smelled delightful. The entrance to the opal suite was a dark wooden door with an actual opal set into it. The swirl of reds and greens and the precious stone were hypnotizing. I slid the passkey through the gold-lined slot at the side of the door and it clicked open. I stepped over the threshold. While I was in the lift, as a precaution, I had got changed into a hazmat suit. It was vacuum packed into a size that fitted easily into my backpack, and wearing it gave me robust protection from hazardous materials, and gases and numerous other things, including, I hoped, miniature monsters. I still didn't know exactly what I was dealing with, but I was confident that they would not be able to make it into my sealed suit. The room that I had entered was in darkness. I couldn't see anything as simple as a light switch, so I tried saying, on. And that did the trick. Discreetly tucked away, light fittings glowed into life, and I could see that I was in a lobby with three doors leading off it. I looked through one, into a lounge with the largest sofa that I had ever seen in my life. More doors opened out from this into the other rooms. I checked the other two doors accessed directly from the lobby. One was a water closet with wall tiles inlaid with more opals and gold taps over a black quartz sink. The other was a bedroom. I could make out the shape of a four-poster bed and felt my feet sink into a thick, luxurious carpet as I moved into the room, even through the all-in-one protective layer of my hazmat suit's booze. I could feel how soft it was. This was a carpet designed to pamper the feet of the bridge. I said, on, and the lights glowed and revealed the critters that I had come looking for. The carpet was crawling with them, fleas, which seemed to have sensed my presence, because all of a sudden they were not just crawling anymore. They were hopping one to two feet into the air. This gymnastic feat would have been impressive, if it hadn't have been so creepy. Under the hazmat suit, my skin began to edge. The irritation that I was feeling was all in my mind, I knew. 
though some of the jumping fleas were now bouncing off me, they had no way through the suit. Surely. I must admit I was beginning to worry that I wasn't going to be safe from them for long. More and more of the fleas were jumping up, and the ones that were not, they were crowding around my feet and starting to rush up my legs. I was no expert in flea behavior, but this seemed extreme. This seemed strange. I decided to make a hasty retreat from the bedroom. By doing this, I took a whole host of fleas with me, but they would have spread from the bedroom anyway sooner or later. This was a problem that was only going to multiply unless I dealt with it. The hazmat suit had a built-in phone, thankfully, as there was no way that I wanted to take it off to use my phone. I called the monitoring team and I asked for assistance. When my colleague arrived, equipped with a passkey of their own, they found me standing in one of the showers in the Opal Suite. The shower was turned on full. I was still dressed from head to toe in the hazmat suit, and despite the force of the water, some of the fleas continued to cling onto it. My colleague wore a hazmat suit as well and carried a bag holding a small laboratory's worth of equipment. I had requested that the fleas be tested. Something was making them hyper-aggressive and I needed to know what it was. After testing half a dozen fleas, holding them down with sturdy tweezers and taking samples and analyzing these, my colleague looked at me with an expression of shock on his face. My voice muffled by my suit, I asked. What is it? He swallowed and replied. The fleas are infected. My mind began to race. What kind of infection would cause them to behave in this way? Fleas had been behind the Black Death that had ravaged through Europe centuries ago. Was this the beginning of a new and terrible plague? Fear building inside me, I asked in a hesitant voice. What are they infected with? His answer shocked me to the core. Lycanthropy. The fleas have ingested the blood of a werewolf and now it is the full moon and the infected blood is sending them crazy. If they could get at our flesh, they would try to tear us to pieces. I leaned forwards and put my hands on my knees and tried to steady my breathing. Okay, I said, hoping that I sounded calmer than I felt. In that case, we need to isolate this hotel and everyone and everything in it until dawn and the end of the full moon. After that, the regular exterminators can blitz the place. He did not ask me how to seal off the hotel. The people who worked for the department were the best at finding solutions to the craziest of problems, and I was happy to leave it to my colleague. I had another priority. I needed to find the source of the infection. I was looking for a werewolf. I discarded the hazmat suit and then cornered the hotel manager in his office. I told him, I need a list of all the staff that had serviced the Opal Suite and the guests who have stayed there in the last month. He didn't look happy about this, but he complied. I sent the list of staff and guests onto the monitoring team and asked them to do a detailed check of all the individuals on it. I had a theory. Firstly, I assumed that the fleas had been long-term residents in the Opal Suite. Hotel rooms, even the poshest, were rife with all sorts of bugs. The second part of my theory was that someone infected with lycanthropy had spent time in the Opal Suite recently, when the moon was not full. A cleaner or one of the well-to-do guests, the fleas had bitten them and ingested their blood. I shuddered as I thought once more of what this had done to the fleas. I had left the hotel before it was quarantined and I stood in the street. There was no breeze and the hot night air had added to my discomfort. Thankfully, the super efficient monitoring team soon sent me what I needed. The names of one of the individuals on the list had raised a red flag. Benedict Watts was the eldest son of a family that had earned a fortune from selling pharmaceuticals. He was wealthy beyond most people's wildest dreams. Surveillance material held by the department indicated that he might also be a werewolf. The torn apart carcasses had been found after full moons at close to locations that he was known to frequent. There was also CCTV footage showing a wolf-like creature in the vicinities. This had not been enough for the department to act, but that was about to change. 
because Benedict had stayed at the Opal Suite two weeks before. The latest intel obtained by the monitoring team showed me that he was currently in residence at a multi-million pound townhouse owned by his family. It was tucked away on one of London's most exclusive streets. An hour later, I was breaking in. I dropped down from the window that I had cut out and landed with cat-like agility on my feet in a long corridor. It was in darkness apart from a sliver of light coming from a door to my left that was slightly ajar. I crept towards it, inched it slowly open enough for me to squeeze through and then froze. There was someone sitting in a high-backed chair in the center of the room. He wore an expensively tailored suit, and his short dark hair was slicked back into a center part and he was looking at me and smiling. Well, what do we have here? He asked in an arrogant tone. Are you a burglar, a common thief? I composed myself and stood up straight. I work for the government and I'm looking for Benedict Watts. He gave me a sarcastic round of applause as he said, well, congratulations, you found him. I am who you seek. So much for my number one suspect, I thought. He was a man, not a monster, but still I hoped that he could help in my hunt. In a calm, professional manner, I asked, and is it correct that you recently stayed in the Opal Suite? His smile became a sneer. I did, he replied. I stayed there with my friends. Would you like to meet them? In the wake of his words, a creature entered the room. It moved on all fours and it was sleek and terrifying a figure from the nightmare realm. This was the beast that I sought. This was the werewolf. Only it was not alone. Three more of the abhorrent beasts followed in its trail, and then all four of the werewolves began to circle me. Their dark, chilling eyes fixed on me. Their claws extended and their fangs were revealed as they snarled. I always went equipped with silver bullets, and a weapon on the night of a full moon. They were still in my backpack. I reached round for them. The odds were stacked impossibly against me, but even so, I had to try. I would not go down without a fight. And Benedict remained seated. It seemed that he was in league with the werewolves, the elegant human leader of their pack. You might wing one of them, he said, but the others will make short work of you. You'll make a nice starter course before I send them out onto the streets to feed. I'm going to end you, I hissed. He laughed. You, he said with scorn. I don't think so. The words were barely out of his mouth when the sound of shattering glass filled the air. I span round and grinned. Two of my colleagues from the department had run into the room. There would be no stealth and they would smash their way in and fragments of broken glass were still falling off them as they drew and aimed. A pair of the werewolves howled and fell. The other two were downed seconds later, and that left just Benedict. He didn't hang about and he sprinted for the door, but unfortunately for him, another of my colleagues was waiting outside and took him into custody. And that should have been it. Another case closed, leaving me free to hunt new monsters and keep London safe. But things did not work out that way. I thought the downed werewolves were history. They lay slumped on the floor and were changing slowly back into the human form. I had let my guard down. I could not react quickly enough when one of them leapt up to me and bit me. This was the last thing that it ever did, but that was no consolation for me. I was infected. The test that I took after I was bitten confirmed this. It was my supervisor who told me that we could not take any risks, and then he put me on an indefinite leave for my job with the department for strange affairs. So that's me now. I feel lost without my work and I'm scared of what the future might bring, but I haven't given up. Strange things happen and perhaps science will find a cure for my condition, but until then I can only hope. There's a full moon tonight. I have bolted the windows and drawn the curtain so I can't see it, but I can feel it. It's calling the creature inside me. I open the lid of my sleeping place. I've had it adapted. The silk lining has been replaced with steel and once I click the lid closed, an automatic lock will be activated. 
It's on a timer and will not be possible for the lid to be opened until after the full moon. I climb into the darkness, seal myself in, and wait for the change to begin.